This audio book is a member of the Witness to History series. It is entitled The Tragic Truth About the FDR Era, Volume B, The New Deal and World War II. It was recorded on February 11, 1976 by Colonel Curtis B. Dow and Dr. Peter Beter. For a complete introduction, please refer to Volume A of The Tragic Truth About the FDR Era. Uh, Colonel Dow, uh, how would you trace the development of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt from a housewife to a world leader, for example? In the political field? Well, um, Dr. Beta, uh, that's an interesting question. You could go into that at length, but I will say briefly that she was encouraged by Louis Howe in particular to become knowledgeable from a political point of view to help her husband rehabilitate himself in political life after his attack of poliomyelitis, which is very commendable. Uh, she became highly involved in the socialistic elements uh, of the political area, and she moved more and more, as I see it, to that hackneyed term called the left, if there is such a thing. And um, she became more socialistic-minded. She became more self-confident. She made a great many more speeches. At first she was very nervous and her voice was not particularly good, but she became very proficient in that. And with the power of her husband being in the White House, she was in great demand and she became absolutely an outstanding development of, uh, I would call it, a socialistic policy for this country. How, how would you compare her with the wife of Woodrow Wilson, for example? There's no comparison whatsoever. The wife of Woodrow Wilson, Mrs. Galt, she was just looked after Woodrow Wilson's health in his latter years, and Eleanor Roosevelt was a, a figure in the political world entirely, quite in addition to that, but on her own. She was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she was in some respects more powerful than the president. In what respect? In the, uh, I would say, in the field of human relations. You know, here in Washington, she has been held up uh, over the years as a person who brought the uh, uh, many members of the uh, black race from the South here to give them their start. Uh, did, did she did that on her own, or, or was she educated to do that? Dr. Beter, that's an easy question to answer. She did that because uh, you could get votes by doing that, and she would out for votes morning, noon, and night. As you know, many wives are, are very influential with their husbands. Do you think that uh, she was influential with uh, Franklin? Yes, I do. And uh, you mean he followed her uh, advice? In great many cases he followed very closely. And she was getting advice from mostly from whom? In, in the she beginning? was getting advice from a good many people, uh, Dr. Beta, and most of them on the left-wing side. So therefore, anybody who was a moderate or on the conservative side, so-called, uh, could not uh, get in to talk to her about any uh, problems facing America. She could get in probably to talk to her, but I don't think she would be uh, uh, in accordance with the views as, as expressed there, and she probably wouldn't lay very much stress on that if she had discussed the matter with her husband. So she was very analytical when it came to She politics. was very desirous of personal power. So in, in many respects, she was like her husband, uh, who was uh, seeking power uh, here in the United States and also worldwide. That's correct, Dr. Beta. Now, when she was that powerful, uh, being the wife of the president, uh, did she also know about the Council of Foreign Relations, or oh, did the I'm president? Sure she knew all about it, yes, uh, because uh, the president, as I recall it, he appointed Norman Davis to be the first president of the Council on Foreign Relations. I knew Norman Davis, and uh, that's when they were setting it up. They set it up shortly after the end of World War I, but it grew, it grew in power, and the Council of Relations along in the 30s was very powerful as it is today, even more so today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Council of Foreign Relations, Colonel? Yes, Dr. Beter, the Council of Foreign Relations, as I understand it, was uh, conceived by a few very large individuals in the financial and political world to overcome the deficiencies of what they recognized as the failure of the peace conference at the end of World War I. In addition to desiring increased political power and ensuring the advent of a what we call a United Nations today, whatever that is, the uh, CFR was supposed to set a program which would protect the fortunes of very large 
owners of this world's goods, such as the Carnegie Foundation, such as the Rockefeller Foundation, and 50 or 100 other very large foundations. Tax exempt. Tax exempt at that time, now almost completely tax exempt. So the background of the Council on Foreign Relations is, is a power structure. Uh, it has a membership of somewhere around 1,500 members. And I would say out of the 1,500 members who are glad to be a member because it's a prestigious organization for lawyers and bankers and uh, doctors and uh, uh, insurance people and what have you, newspaper men, uh, I don't think that there's more than 5% um, of them that really know why they're members or what really goes on. And I think the strings of the CF are, are pulled by at least uh, uh, not more than 5 or 10 men. Does it have a, a, a counterpart in, in England? Oh, yes. Yes. And a counterpart? The Royal Institute for International Affairs in London. And the CFR was supposed to be the American offset number of that, which was set up there at the time of the Versailles Conference. Conference, And then in addition, there's sort of a merger. And I think you can see in the Bilderberger organization that more or less of a composite assembly of both groups. And uh, the Bilderberger today is headed by Prince Bernhard. Uh, the CFR today, how powerful do you think it is? It is my personal feeling that no one can be elected president of the United States today unless it has the approval or the non-disapproval of the Council on Foreign Relations. It's that powerful, in my opinion. It's quite a tight union. You said it. Uh, the CFR is also uh, comparable to that trilateral commission that they have set up, uh, as well as other uh, similar organizations, Colonel. Uh, I want to bring in some personalities. For example, uh, Herbert Lehman, uh, who later became senator and who played a great role in bringing down uh, Senator McCarthy by accusing Senator McCarthy of being anti-Semitic. Uh, did you bring Herbert Lehman and uh, FDR together? Well, I, th I think I can accurately say that because uh, whereas FDR and Herbert Lehman knew each other slightly in World War I, I was working for, at that time for Lehman Brothers and were very friendly with the Lehman Brothers partners, of which Mr. Herbert was the third-ranking one. Mr. Philip Lehman was a senior partner at the time, and uh, when uh, Anna and I became engaged, why, um, they were interested in the uh, partnership uh, for which I was working, a very important international banking house, and uh, uh, as things worked out, why uh, the Lehmans uh, later came to some dinners that we gave, and uh, FDR and Herbert Lehman became closely allied from a political, from a political point of view, Dr. Beter, not financial, but political, and the, uh, and the seed that I planted certainly grew into a big tree. Well, who were some of these people? Uh, I know you've mentioned them in your book, uh, FDR, My Exploited Father-in-Law, but uh, who were some of these so-called left-wingers or... Well, I would uh, say that the Kuhn Loeb firm and the Morgan firm, to some extent, who were interested in supporting a left-wing group organization at that time, Bernard Baruch. Um, would you include Felix uh, Otto Kahn, um, Jacob Schiff, to some yeah. extent Joe Kennedy. Felix Frankfurter? Oh, yes, Felix Frankfurter, but he wasn't too important in the financial world. He was important in the ideological world. And how about the Rockefellers? Well, the Rockefellers were beginning to come into that picture with both feet, and that expanded later on in the four, in the three or four years that followed. How about uh, Louis uh, McHenry? Louis, Louis McHenry Howe, Howe, that's really a story almost unto itself. Uh, he, uh, I don't know, Dr. Beter, I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but Louis Howe attached himself to FDR when he was just a reporter for an Albany paper way back there along about 1912 or 14 because he, he became attached to FDR feeling that he was politically important. And, of course, he was. He became assistant secretary of the Navy. And then Louis Howe later on came to live with FDR when he was crippled and he became a sort of a political advisor uh, to FDR. And he became, um, a, uh, I would say, a um, political advisor in a larger sense to um, Mrs. FDR, my former mother-in-law, Mama, 
And I can remember many nights when uh, Louis Howe was indoctrinating her on the pros and the cons of political things in the United States and going over many newspaper accountings. And so Louis Howe was a very important factor in that whole picture, but I could expand upon that if, uh, if you have some time. I would I'd... like to know uh, what influence he had upon uh your mother-in-law, he had Louis a very, Howe. He had a very great influence on, um, on um, Mama, and he had a very important influence on FDR, not quite so much. But Louis Howe was um, a very close touch with the, the big left-wingers, and uh, Louis, Louis Howe and I were always at loggerheads. We never agreed on anything. He was very down on Wall Street, and yet he went down to Wall Street to get money to support the political program, and so Louis Howe and I were not at all friendly. I think that Louis Howe was a very close political advisor to both FDR and, and Mamar, increasingly so after 1930. Uh, did you have occasion uh, to meet any other uh, important people who uh, came down from New York City uh, to be with the administration or people who wanted to have jobs with you? Henry Morgan now Jr. had this big suite at the um, hotel, and he invited me out there for dinner one of these evenings, and I went out there and had dinner with him. Henry and I are pretty good friends, at least we were up to a point. He was the son of old Uncle Henry. We used to call him. He was the ambassador to Turkey in the Woodrow Wilson regime. Mrs. Roosevelt and Anna were attending a, a very distinguished woman's uh, party that evening, so Henry took it upon himself and to invite me out for dinner. He inquired certain questions for me and tried to use those questions to his own advantage that I answered uh, very naively as an old friend. Uh, Colonel, uh, how come, how was it that uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr., how come that he was uh, so important that he could ask you, who was a member of the family in the White House, to come to have uh, dinner with him uh, at his hotel? Well, Dr. Peter, there's a lot behind that picture, and I'll have to go back and tell you a little bit of history that his father, old Uncle Henry, was quite an operator in um, business deals and in Bronx real estate and made a great deal of money out of Bronx real estate with others. You mean Bronx, New York? Bronx, New York. Uh, it seems that he, in one of his uh, promotions, became heavily involved in financing the Photomaton Corporation, both here and in, in New York and in London. And FDR put quite a little money in it. Apparently, the photomaton deal flopped. FDR lost a, a lot of money in it, which is probably put up by Granny. But at that time, he apparently discussed this matter with old Uncle Henry. And he said, now, Uncle Henry, I want you to make me whole on this deal, and I'll always remember your favor and respect to you, your son, Henry Morgenthau, who comes over to Hyde Park all the time, and Henry doesn't know very much about finances, you know, but I'll try to help him. So the deal was worked out where FDR was made whole, and Henry Morgenthau, Jr. was put on the preferred list. What type of, uh, what type of questions would he ask you? Well, toward the end of the meal, he, um, he got out a pad of paper there, and he said... Uh, what specific um, suggestions would you have for the Democratic Party to improve the situation in Wall Street? Well, I gave him a few answers. And he, he wrote them down on paper there, none of which was self-serving to me, as I uh, was meticulous and always had been, not to inject my personal business with FDR's business. Although the other members of the family didn't observe that, <laughs> shall I say, that um, those sentiments. So he asked me these questions, and I told him and a few little suggestions as to how the business of the commodity department should be handled, spread around to various people and not monopolized by one or two brokers. And, um, and I made two or three other suggestions I thought would be helpful in a general way. I completely forgot about the dinner with Henry Morgenthau until about three or four weeks later on, when in New York City... Anna had come over there, and, and she said to me, we have to be more careful with you, Curtis, because you have made some dangerous statements. When I was sitting on Pa's bed yesterday morning, Henry Morgenthau Jr. came in there, and he said, we have to be careful. 
with Curtis because look what he's given me as a suggestion to improve the Democratic program. Henry Morgenthau took this piece of paper and with great theatrical alacrity tore it up and threw it in the wastebasket. Henry Morgenthau was set up to do that because some of these internationalists were afraid that I might be appointed Secretary of the Treasury. And uh, after this uh, incident took place, Colonel, uh, two weeks later, I think something very important happened uh, in the White House. Could you describe it for our listeners? Well, I was down in Washington at the White House for the weekend from New York. And uh, being in and out of there, you see a lot of things that go on. And I happened to notice um, one morning about um, 8.30 early in the morning, five or six very unusual looking men with long beards were shepherded by Louis Howe into a room downstairs and they looked rather awed at the surroundings and it was very sort of a sort of a hush hush kind of a deal. It just aroused my curiosity and I asked the usher a little later on who the schedule of visitors were that morning in the White House. I said, did Mr. Howe have five or six friends uh, listed as uh, callers? Because there is a callers list, you know, Dr. Beter, in the White House is a callers list. And he looked the list over very carefully. He said, no, I don't see anything here that Mr. Howe is receiving any early morning guests. So that further aroused my curiosity. And later on, I um, asked Louis Howe about that. And what did he say? Well, this meeting, uh, this rather colorful meeting, it took place about one day or two days later in the evening. It was about 9.30, and I was about to go to bed, and I stopped on the second floor of the White House to say goodnight to Mama. Louis Howe was there discussing certain political matters with her. The three of us stood in the hall, and I made a remark to Mama that I felt that certain observations in respect to Wall Street could be better phrased coming out of the new political regime in Washington. As I was vitally concerned then, I knew the tempo of Wall Street. Louis Howe fell a felt called upon to inject himself into the picture and criticize my remark. Stung me a little bit, and I said, Lloyd, who are you to tell me what I'm supposed to say if I want to to Mama? And I said, furthermore, I want to ask you a question. He said, who were those <clears throat> long-bearded goats five or six of them that you shepherded in this room at the White House early this morning that were not on the callers list. Now, you tell me. He's turned sort of pale, I thought, and rocked on his feet, and so did Mama to some extent. Dr. Beter, I said every one of those long-bearded goats, and I repeat the word, looked like they came right out of communist Russia, and I believe they had. That was about the end of the conversation, and I said good night and departed, and I never saw him again, Dr. Beter. So that... He died about a year later. And then FDR had a difficult time replacing him, and they finally got a hold of Harry Hopkins. I believe that uh, Harry Hopkins uh, was one of the instigators uh, of sending some uh, money plates to Russia. Did you know about that? Yes, I've I've studied that, and I read uh, some very interesting material by uh, Major Racy Jordan. Uh, Harry Hopkins, as I recall it, was brought in to be an important assistant to FDR after the demise of Louis McHenry Howe. He was, uh, his record was that he was a very liberal, um, minded man that was uh, easily uh, dictated to by internationalists and he probably had the backing of some of the leading internationalists otherwise he wouldn't have been put there and he rose rapidly and pretty soon FDR began to lean on him very heavily and as FDR's health waned 
why uh, Harry Hopkins became almost a, a sort of an assistant president, you might say. Was he uh, very close to Eleanor? They, li they lived in the White House, and I think that she thought very well of his political philosophy. Uh, going to some of the people that you uh, knew personally, uh, Colonel, uh, have, did you meet a Mr. Landis? I mean, yes, I knew him very well. We were in school together at Mercersburg. James McCauley That's Landis it. was his name. That's it. And uh, he was uh, he started out in the, in the class in Princeton, with the same class that I was in, the class of, in 1920. Uh, Landis was a very bright student, and he later became closely associated with uh, Professor Felix Frankfurt of Harvard, later of uh, Washington fame. And uh, in one of my discussions about Landis with Felix Frankfurt, I'm afraid I offended him by suggesting that maybe Landis, and his name was his nickname was Chink Landis, he was slightly liberal, as I put it, but that didn't please Mr. Frankfurt. Why was that? Because Mr. Frankfurt was very far to the left himself. In fact, I think he was highly involved in even more left-wing operations than that because he used to get uh, top secret and secret material from communist cells way back as far as 1916. And I've seen some you know, documents to show that Mr. Frankfurt was very, very closely connected with the communist revolution and his movements while he was up there in New England. Then he was the, one of the pillars of the New Deal. That's right. <clears throat> that is right. And what role did Barney Baruch play in that? Well, he was one of the main pillars of the New Deal and the uh, Democratic administration, which will put Franklin Roosevelt in, in the White House, Dr. Beter. Who, who were the members of this so-called brain trust, and where did it originate? The idea of the words brain trust. Well, I didn't develop that idea. I don't know. I think it's just uh, the creature of some newspaper reporter that happened to catch on. And uh, I've covered a good many of the, the people in there in, in our discussions here that, uh, uh, who were in, the, in that group. I mentioned Felix Frankfurter a short time ago as being one of the important pillars of the New Deal. Yes. And close to my father-in-law. Uh, you may also be surprised to know that I've been told on good authority that he was the nephew of... Judge Brandeis on the Supreme Court, who was appointed there by Wilson in a rather unusual story. You mean Louis Brandeis? Yes. And what was this unusual story? It goes back to Woodrow Wilson's days in Princeton, and he was, he wandered down um, the Primrose Path a little bit, and a well-known widow in Princeton was uh, in possession of a great many of his uh, love letters, as the story goes. When uh, Woodrow Wilson got to Washington, and then 30 days or so had elapsed, he had a call from Samuel Lindemeyer, a big New York lawyer. And the conversation went like this, such as I have had it told to me. Uh, Mr. President, I represent a client whose son uh, is in trouble with one of the banks here, and uh, he needs some money to bail himself out, and we would like to have you uh, come up with about $150,000 so, uh, uh, to uh, take care of this matter involving Mrs. Peck. And uh, I think I can get the matter settled for that figure. Well, uh, the president is reported to have said, well, uh, Mr. Unamar, I haven't got that kind of money, but let me think it over. Come back in a couple of weeks. So, Mr. Undermeyer came back in a couple of weeks, and um, he said, I think we can settle this for slightly less. But again, the president said, uh, well, I haven't got that kind of money. And so then Mr. Undermeyer said, to him, well, he said, uh, Mr. President, I have an idea, and I can discuss this with my associates. Uh, there's going to be an opening shortly on the Supreme Court, and if you would agree to support, if you would agree to appoint Louis Brandeis to the Supreme Court, I will take this thing up with my associates and see if we can get this matter settled for the uh, benefit of all concerned, of course, which is what I want to do. And uh, the president reportedly said, why, uh, uh, Mr. Undermeyer, that's a very good suggestion. Let's, t let's think it over. And the meeting ended that afternoon, and in due course, Mr. Louis Brandeis was appointed to the Supreme Court.
And the matter was closed. I think that's a very unusual story. What a story. What a story that is. Of course, you know, being a lawyer, I've always uh, been able to uh, study the opinions of uh, Louis Brandeis, and uh, they are very penetrating. Well, he's a very outstanding lawyer. And now uh, we find ourselves uh, in the 40s. Uh, I understand that you uh, were very instrumental in uh, creating a, uh, a gas transmission company. Well, in the beginning of um, 1940, I organized and formed a company to bring natural gas into the Appalachian area. It was called Tennessee Gas and Transmission Company. We got gas from Texas and we Louisiana, and we were to bring it up here. I met very, very formidable opposition from the powers that be in the... Um, in the gas world, but finally we succeeded in getting a permission to build this line, and it came up from Texas into the Appalachian area, and then after I went into the um, armed forces in World War II, the company, under the able management of men in Houston, Texas, the company grew and grew, and, uh, and then it changed its name to Tenneco. And it's uh, a several billion dollar company today, a large conglomerate, and I'm very proud to be able to say that I was the founder of it and the first president of it. But I resigned when I went into the armed forces. You did volunteer your services. I know you were in the First World War. That's uh, right. I was a. I enlisted in the First World War as a second class seaman in Uncle Sam's Navy. And I emerged from that, uh, Dr. Beter, as an ensign in uh, naval aviation, having served overseas, uh, both with the Royal Naval Air Forces in, uh, in England and later on in our air stations in France. In World War II, I volunteered to join up again, and I was at that time um, a major and I served for a number of years and finally ended up as a colonel in the um, inactive reserve of our Air Force. And I have had 13 and a half years of active and volunteer service in Uncle Sam's forces. Uh, going back into more detail on this gas transmission company, uh, did you have any difficulties uh, in trying to get the permissions from the Federal Power Commission? Uh, great difficulties, uh, Dr. Beter, almost insurmountable. In fact, I had opposition from the Standard Oil of New Jersey subsidiary, the Hope Natural Gas, the J.H. Hillman Jr. Interest of Pittsburgh, who ranked second to the Mellons there, the uh, soft coal lobby of the South, the, with uh, various important labor leaders, uh, Appearing against it, it was a very difficult, very, very difficult job to get that in. But I, my judgment proved to be right, and it's a, it, it performed a real service to aid the sinews of fighting World War II. This company was headed by a gentleman named Mr. Tonkin. They opposed our application for a certificate of public convenience and necessity before the Federal Power Commission. I felt that their opposition was unfair, particularly during wartime. So I went to see an old friend, Nelson Rockefeller, whom I knew years ago in North Tarrytown. And I asked Nelson if he wouldn't speak to Mr. Tonkin and ask him to withdraw his opposition to us merely during the time of war when all Americans should join forces at the conclusion of the war why we could resolve our respective differences because the Hope Natural Gas Company was a big company and Tennessee Gas and Transmission Company was a very small one of which I was the head. Well, Nelson told me, he said, well, Kurt, he said, I, I haven't got anything to do with the oil business anymore. I'm the coordinator uh, of Latin American affairs. I said, yes, I know you haven't got much to do with the oil business Nelson, you and your family, you just control it. Now let's get down to business. I said, please, let's cooperate during the wartime. So he says, okay, Kurt. He says, okay. He said, you send a telegram to Mr. Tonkin to uh, collaborate during the wartime. And I think that's a good suggestion. I said, thanks very much, Nelson. Best regards to you. And I went away. I sent Mr. Tonkin a wire that afternoon 
And he replied the next morning with a very testy wire to me, I am not interested, quote, I am not interested in saving critical war materials, period. Well, in 30 days, Mr. Tonkin was no longer president of the Hope Natural Gas Company and Tennessee Gas and Transmission Company sailed ahead and we got our certificate. Dr. Beter, how do you like that one? Well, that's very good news. Uh, how would you like this? Now the, the Rockefeller interests and uh, their associates now control that very company. So okay. you were working in effect uh, for Nelson Rockefeller because uh, even though he... Controlling what company? Uh, Teneco Company. My point is that Nelson Rockefeller said, okay, let you go ahead and do this, and then here they are benefiting, what I'm saying, from your early activities. That's quite possible, Dr. Uh, Beard. Uh, so they, they win, uh, whichever way uh, the ball bounces. All right, let me ask you a question, Dr. Beater. How many times do you see the Standard Oil Group lose? Uh, I've seen them lose once. When and, was that? Uh, and yet the show is still going on. That's with uh, Soha uh, Sohio, the uh, Standard Oil Company of Ohio, uh, under which uh, uh, BP, British Petroleum, has uh, taken a 25% interest. And if this interest will increase uh, to 52% based upon the amount of oil that is going to be pumped through the Alaskan pipeline. But I assure you that uh, Alaskan pipeline will uh, rarely, if ever, uh, carry oil because of the coming world war. So uh, I think in the end the Rockefellers uh, uh, may uh, win this also and prevent uh, British Petroleum uh, from taking uh, a controlling interest in uh, Standard Oil of Ohio. Dr. Beater, do you think there's a coming war? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, this is their scenario, and we will go into that later on. I'll be very interested to talk to you more on that point. Right. Uh, now, uh, uh, having uh, related that, we're now uh, going overseas, and uh, uh, you must have had occasion that sometimes uh, uh, carrying uh, secret letters or uh, getting in contact with your old friend FDR and have long talks. Could you uh, tell us anything about that? Well, I think you refer to a, to a situation there which I might briefly comment upon. I was ordered to go overseas to join the 12th Air Force in World War II, and I had said goodbye to the family and uh, friends and was, had my bags packed, and I stopped by the White House by appointment, of course, to say hello to the president and pay my respects and say goodbye because we were always very friendly. And I might say, Dr. Beter, that I was one of his mother's three trustees, so it should have been very friendly. So she did not want to have me disturbed as one of her three trustees, even though I was not technically in the family, which I regard as a very great compliment coming from Sarah Delano Roosevelt. So I stopped in there, and we had a very nice chat. And he seemed to want to talk longer and longer, and I noticed out in the hall there was about 15 or 20 people waiting to see him. People would come in, open the door to see if everything was going on, and he'd wave them out. And he and I still kept talking there. And he said, I would like to have you deliver a letter to my son, Elliot. I said, I'd be delighted to, Mr. President, as I was very formal. And so he wrote and wrote and wrote. And heads would pop in the door, and finally he gave me this letter. And I said, I'd be delighted to deliver it to him personally when I get there. Well, strangely enough, late that afternoon, I don't know what happened. I never did. But I know my immediate boss in the Pentagon was very annoyed. But orders came back from the 12th Air Force to not have me come there. Now, whether Elliot had anything to do with it, I do not know. I simply know that I was, my orders were canceled and I remained in the Pentagon. So I was forced to return this very personal letter to the president by special messenger, and I don't know what happened, but it must have been very embarrassing to him. One of the most uh, significant moments of my life, Colonel, was Pearl Harbor. I remember exactly where I was uh, in Detroit, uh, having dinner with friends of mine. Where were you when Pearl Harbor happened? I was in Washington, D.C., I believe. Do you recall how you felt when you first heard it? Well, I was flabbergasted and uh, I couldn't imagine how a situation like that could have happened 
unbeknownst to the commanders in charge with reporting the advance of the Japanese task force. I never could understand it until at a later date. If you'd like to have me tell you about that, I'd be delighted to do it. I do, because I I remember very well reading your book, uh, The War Lords of Washington, which uh, contained uh, uh, the secrets of Pearl Harbor, and uh, I wish you would uh, uh, give your impressions around the White House as it existed at that time and subsequent there, too. Dr. Beter, I may be accused of being abrasive, but when I first heard about the real inside story of this thing, I nearly fell on the floor and bumped my head, and it took me about two years to get over the effects of it. It was so devastating. There is no doubt in my mind but that the big internationalist powers wanted to get us into World War II in the worst way. Germany would not fall for a second repeat of World War I, and they were staying aloof. So therefore, FDR and uh, Mr. Baruch, Mr. Frank Freder, and some of the other boys in the hierarchy had to figure out how America could become involved. And so they went via the tripartite treaty with Japan, Italy and Germany, whereby if any one of those powers were attacked, the others would have to join forces. So the Secretary of War, Stimson, concocted the plan with FDR and others to lure the Japanese task force to attack Pearl Harbor on a specific time. The Japanese task force, according to what Admiral Kimmel told me several years later, right out of his mouth, and he and I became friendly before he died. He said if the Japanese task force had had advanced information that the American forces at Pearl Harbor were alerted, they had specific instructions, Dr. Beter, to return to safe waters. So therefore, certain interests on a Saturday night brought all the defenses around Honolulu, Pearl Harbor, in for Saturday night parties and what have you. Some of the carriers were sent away. And on Sunday morning, the Holocaust occurred. Admiral Kimmel knew nothing about it, neither did General Shaw. Admiral told me that he got the message from General Marshall at 2 o'clock in the afternoon to be alerted. When the bomb started to fall on Pearl Harbor at 7 a.m. that morning. And the whole thing is one of the most horrendous examples of perfidy that I have even ever read about or can envision. As I said, it took me about two years to get over it. Now, you've asked me some very pertinent questions. Yes, I think the president and his group around him, including General Marshall, whom I regard as a sort of a traitor, They knew about when this attack was going to happen because FDR had insulted the Japanese. They didn't know exactly to the minute, but the attack from the Japanese was imminent. And when General Marshall went to see Admiral Stark early on the morning of November 7, 1942, Admiral Stark says, General, this means war letters immediately warn General Short and Admiral Kimmel over our new radio. It's pretty fast. We can get that news out there in a half an hour. General Marshall was reported to have said, don't do that. Leave it to me. I will advise them. He did so. And Admiral Kimmel told me he got a wire by Western Union that reached him at 2 o'clock in the afternoon when the bomb started to fall at 7 a.m. this morning. Dr. Media, how do you like that? I think that's simply incredible to me to understand. Uh, This is what I can't understand, uh, Colonel. I remember very well, and I heard it on the radio several times uh, back in 1940, and I want to quote. And while I am talking to you, mothers and fathers, I give you one more assurance. I have said this before, and I shall say it again and again and again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. 
Unquote. That was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his campaign speech in Boston on the eve of the 1940 election. Now, remember, he said, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. What do you say, Colonel Dow? What do I say? I would say that that statement was a deceitful one. I would say that the catchword in there is the word foreign. Pearl Harbor is not foreign. It's part of the U.S., and I think it's part of the, the plan to involve us into World War I largely to serve the best interests of international bankers and the Communist Party. Uh, getting back to uh, the sources that you mentioned, this personal primary evidence, I have also primary evidence to the effect uh, that Pearl Harbor was left defenseless and that the uh, people in charge there after it occurred, those who survived, uh, literally cried on the shoulders of doctors who treated them, and they kept asking why, 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 and many of these people were broken and disheartened, and some of them even committed suicide. Well, Dr. Vita, it's a very tragic subject. I would say that the forces at Pearl Harbor were not rendered defenseless. I would say basically they were not duly alerted. Most of the important carriers and other important vehicles had been deliberately removed, but the factor of surprise on the early Sunday morning attack by the Japanese was what they counted on, and they caught everybody unaware because nobody suspected anything of it. I have before me an article by Colin Cross of the London Observer, and he wrote uh, last January from London, quote, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was so eager to get Americans into World War II in 1941 that he went out of his way to provoke incidents which could be represented as German aggression against America according to British documents now declassified. The documents also show at least that this was what uh, Roosevelt was telling uh, British uh, Prime Minister Winston Churchill in the summer and autumn of that year. Uh, this is revealed in secret wartime uh, British Cabinet documents for 1941-1945. Uh, continuing to quote Colonel, uh, Roosevelt was obviously determined to come into the war, Churchill said. If he were to put the issue of peace or war to Congress, they would debate it for three months. Uh, the <laughs> president, Probably. yes, uh, the president had said that he would wage war but not declare it, and that he would become more and more provocative. If the Germans did not like it, they could attack the American forces. That's exactly what Roosevelt did. He waged war, but did not declare it. So Colonel uh, Pearl Harbor hastened our entry into the uh, Second World War, and uh, could you tell us whether or not there were any acts which could have hastened peace? Uh, Dr. Beter, I recall one particular uh, cogent incident which could have shortened World War II by 17 months and saved thousands and thousands of lives and enormous treasure and suffering. Uh, George Earl was a governor of Pennsylvania for a long time, and he was a close friend of FDR at Harvard. His, uh, his nephew discussed with me some time ago that I should call on George Earl and talk to him about his office over there in the Near East, where Roosevelt appointed him as a special minister. I did so, and after several hours I came away with an ear-popping the story because George Earl was approached by Admiral Canaris of the German Secret Service to say that if America would drop the very abrasive policy of unconditional surrender as put forward by some of our internationalists, that the German people would like to get out from under the reign of Adolf Hitler. And if assurances could be given to him that a less than unconditional surrender could be obtained from Washington. Forces were then in, in 
in, uh, in action to eliminate Adolf Hitler. George Earl com uh, contacted Washington unsuccessfully several times. Finally, he got a reply to take this up with the field commander in Europe, which is, of course, perfectly absurd in view of a matter of this gravity. The field commander at that time was General Dwight Eisenhower, and Dwight Eisenhower didn't know any more uh, than a general would know about the high-level diplomatic phases of which Admiral Canaris had approached George Earl on. Nothing happened to the regret of George Earl, and he came back to Washington expressing great indignation. Hmm. FDR said, well, if you're going to feel that way and talk about it, I'm going to send you to Samoa, which he did at the close of World War II. And George Earl spent the remaining months in Samoa when he was a very, very erudite and very informed minister. So you can see that the forces in Washington did not want to foreclose World War II until the German people had been exhausted, which is a very, very tragic mistake. Well, Colonel, that was as far as Germany was concerned. Uh, how about uh, Japan? Well, I think it's very well known, Dr. Beter, that Japan, several months prior to the close of the war, tried to negotiate a s surrender program, but the powers that be here in Washington did not want that to happen at the time until they would be able to demonstrate the power and destruction of the atomic bomb, which was demonstrated to the horror of many people throughout the world in Japan. Japan was ready to surrender months before the, the bombing of Hiroshima. Of course, you know, uh our experience has shown that certain people do believe that uh, war does alter uh, the structure of life of a nation. Uh, many people cannot believe that uh, peace to these people really means war and complete control over the lives and properties uh, of a nation. Uh, do you believe that uh, this uh, philosophy could have uh, uh, come into it at that time? Well, I certainly do, Dr. Beter, because War is a policy of international bankers and their conniving policies. War, war makes possible for bankers on both sides to reap huge profits. I remember during the Second World War, Colonel, that I had a feeling that under FDR, the country, uh, especially in the third and fourth uh, uh, term of his office, uh, was going down toward a, a collectivist society. Well, you use the word collectivism. I got this feeling that his experiments in socialism and freewheeling, you might say, from a federal government point of view, had about reached its end. And therefore, the powers that be felt that war would be necessary to substantiate a lot of their principles. So we were pushed into World War II. And as you know, wars upset the economic balance. They do a lot of damage to our financial setup, but that's all duly planned for ahead of time, and it generally works out to the profit from international bankers, Dr. Beter, on both sides. Well, uh, that's very hard for the public to understand, but that's what I think. Uh, being from Wall Street, uh, Colonel, uh, you have heard uh, many stories about the Russian Revolution being supported by Wall Street. Uh, in your opinion, uh, how was this brought about? Well, it wasn't supported by Wall Street in total. It was supported by certain elements in Wall Street, uh, Dr. Beter, to be specific. And those elements had been there for some time, and it was the internationalist elements in Wall Street that wanted to overthrow the Tsarist regime. And that was for a hundred years that objective had been in mind of the powerful banking interests of Europe headed by the, the Rothschilds. 
Now, various people had come to this country in our banking setup and were in Wall Street, notably in the, in the firms of Kuhn Loeb, Spire, Ladenberg Talman, and uh, one or two others, notably Kuhn Loeb. And Jacob Schiff was uh, one of the leaders in uh, raising money, uh, important financing, to aid the Bolshevik Revolution in early 1917. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution was changed to be called the, the Communist Revolution later on because the word Bolshevik or Bolshevism was a very ugly, unacceptable word, and it helped to mislead the American public. So Jacob Schiff is one of the leaders there, and he had others that helped him, of course. And substantial money went over to the Soviets uh, in the early part of 1917. Well, we were deeply involved in war. That's part of the technique. This was done while the United States was fighting a war. Well, weren't the Rockefellers at that time using these same bankers as their uh, merchant banks, also their investment bankers? Well, I think the Rockefellers used a good many banks, including uh, the, the Morgan Interest and, and yeah. others there. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't to point my finger at the uh, at that one bank. I think the right. Rockefeller interests were pretty well spread about Wall Street. Yes, and this these same type of people, uh, weren't they also influential in bringing in 1913 the Federal Reserve uh, system? Well, the what? same crowd, absolutely. They, they were the father and the mother of the Federal Reserve system, you might say. We're on the uh, verge of another war another Third World War, and the uh, forces are now gathering uh, to uh, make us uh, complete slaves. Uh, can, is there anything that, uh, that can stop these people from uh, bringing about this war? I know that uh, from our efforts and our talks around the country that uh, we've been getting the questions of what we can do to try to stop this war. And as you know, I've been giving advice as to what people can do to help themselves and to help this country. But to try to stop this war that is coming, uh, this will be the third world war. This will be their third major attempt to subjugate us and to put us under their uh, dictatorial regime. Uh, under a one-world regime, if you please, uh, whether it be the Soviets or the uh, Rockefeller-controlled government here. Uh, what would you have to say at this time to your listeners if you are in a position to help? Dr. Beter, that's a big question, and uh, I really realize that you know a great deal more about it than I do. I have some feelings, though, that I can express or answer your question as I sit here as a law-abiding, loyal American citizen. I think you have to realize that the major foment that we're subjected to is to establish a dictatorial one-world government and have a group of people in the know, in the control there, control all of the money of the world and the economic markets in respect there, too. That's what I think. Colonel, the uh, Rockefeller dynasty, the uh, Roosevelt dynasty, uh, both of these dynasties have benefited uh, from everything here in America. Why do they continually uh, go forward uh, with their alliances with Soviet Russia? Well, Dr. Beta, that's a, that's a difficult question, but a very interesting one, and a great many people ask the same question to me. The best answer I can give to you, and I think it's an accurate answer, is along these lines. The few outstanding leaders of great wealth, super rich we might describe them, can be called corporate socialists, as contrasted with communism, which is state socialism, and which caters to the so-called proletariat. It, there is absolutely no difference between corporate socialism and state socialism except the identity of those which control each group respectively.
The communist has no more idea, the average communist has no more idea of the fact that great wealth supports the communist movement of which he's a part. He's supposed to fight the wealthy and supposed to fight capitalism as his arch enemy. It is ironical to realize that they finance to a large extent the movements of the state socialists. And you might say, why do they do this? The answer is, when you have a lot of money, most people want to get more. If you're greedy to start with, you become more greedy. And soon the geographical limits of a country vanish, and a man begins to think on an international plane. The super rich group in this corporate state, the corporate socialists, they want profits. They want increased profits. They want increased markets. They want increased control of the world's money supply. The whole communist setup in Soviet Russia is an experiment by the super rich to move world socialism along. And therefore, my answer to you is that if the American people understood what motivated our communist program in our State Department, there would be a revolution of some sort. Now, maybe Thomas Jefferson is right when he said that there should be a revolution every 30 or 60 days if our government got out of hand here. It seems to me that our government is out of hand here in this country because it's overly influenced by the corporate socialists in New York and in the capital centers of the world. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it does, Colonel Dow. I want to thank you very much for uh, appearing with us here today and informing the American people, making them aware of the dangers that are facing them. And I look forward to another serious discussion with you. And on behalf of our listeners, may I say God bless you and keep you forever. Thank you, Dr. Beatty. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And I hope that the American people, in listening to our frank exchange here tonight, will get some ideas whereby we can save our country and the fine heritage which we have had handed to us from our forebears.